Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third day of EP 2021. As you see, now I am not alone. I have three speakers with me. And today, the, this, the panel discussion of digital politics and activism is taking place. So I will begin by giving you the agenda for today. And then we're going to have this the lovely people present themselves and then um, so for the topics today the there is Gorda uh, is all about our future or responsibility so we're talking about how global warming also influences politics as the climate change became more serious and more obvious more and more people decided to take comprehensive actions on climate change during this lecture you will be presented different forms of political engagement in order to bring about change and make our future more sustainable. Um, the agenda for today is first, we're going to have a brief introduction of our three participants. Then we're going to talk about the topic politics of climate change. Then we're going to do a Q&A. Then we're going to talk about activism. Then we're going to do a Q&A through Discord or YouTube. You can leave your comments there. And then we can, I, I will ask the questions to the speakers. And the last topic will be perspectives for climate change action. And then we will have your Q&A. Then it will follow a little summary from my part. And then we will have the goodbye words from everyone, uh, for, from our speakers that will give us some advice or some inspiration in the end of the talk. So with that said, I want to introduce to, to you um, Professor Jens Rolling von der TU Ilmenau, Sabine Lesko und Jana Mascioli. Welcome, everyone. Um, I think we can start uh, with that order. So, Professor Jens Rolling, the word is yours. Thank you. Will you show the presentation? Or should I share? No, oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> See? Okay. So, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, to uh, participate in this discussion. Uh, what you see on the slides, these are the members of my team. Uh, you see their names and also the topics they are working on. Most of them are doing their PhD at the moment. Others already have finished with their PhD and uh, well, they are working on, on different projects, uh, but they are also working together in several projects. And I'm very happy to have an, very international teams in total from five countries. Uh, that's really nice uh, to work together in this international perspective also. And uh, the team is very big at the moment because we are very successful or very happy to be successful in getting some, some projects. So we have uh, different fundings for, for several projects and therefore I'm happy to work with all these people. Can you show the next slide, please? Okay, so if you go to, to our website, a new design website now from TU Ilmenau, <laughs> and this is a page uh, of our research. So uh, these are the main topics we are working on at the moment. So we have this uh, sustainability issue, so related to what we are going to talk today about the environment, climate, and especially also on energy issues. Then the, the second big topic is about migration. Uh, so on the one hand side, refugees, especially with a focus on refugees, but also on migration in Europe in, in general. Um, then we have an interesting topic, what's called uh, issue fatigue. So it's about uh, that people get somehow tired or bored or even annoyed when they listen to the same topic again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. <laughs> okay, that's the idea of issue fatigue. And so we are investigating what happens if uh, people feel that uh, the, the media talk too much about a certain issue. Okay, the next one is about digitalization and uh, in, in, in schools or education. We we'll focus on schools, so we are doing project, this project, especially here in Thuringia. And in Germany, it's a really big issue. In other parts of the world, uh, well, it's a, uh, schools are more advanced, so digitalization is not a big thing there. But in Germany, it's a big thing, and especially in the Corona crisis, uh, we felt that it was really a, a big, big problem here. The next one is, uh, well, one of my colleagues working on a, on a project, or on, a, on a theory, I would say, uh, how people relate to the world. And, uh, well, he, he developed it very well, and he also got a prize for that from the, from the, from the National Organization of Communication. And uh, 
the, the interesting thing for me is uh, uh, communication scientists frequently talk more about the media and forget that there is something like the reality behind that. And uh, I think what he what he did, he brought reality back to communication research, and uh, therefore it's um, I think it's a good uh, good approach that he developed. The last one is very uh, recent. Uh, it's about Corona. So we did some research on a Corona issue, or a panel study here in the last one and a yeah, it's already one and a half year. Uh, we did uh, research on this. Not a pan I'm accelerating, but more than one year <laughs> uh, we we are doing this research on this Corona issue. Okay, that's the last one, and now the last. So the, the, the focus for today will be on two topics, climate change communication, energy transition communication. Um, well, we did several projects. We did content analysis, uh, analysis on media coverage, efforts, effects of media, use on attitudes and behavioral intentions, Twitter networks of deniers, climate change communication on Instagram. We did work on energy transition, media use and attitudes toward renewables, protest against, and that's for me in this context, perhaps very important, protest against energy infrastructure projects, effects of Fukushima on media coverage and attitudes, and um, well, a recent project we are working on how to communicate the energy transition to the public. So this is a yeah, funding, funded project from the German government who wants to engage in that and uh, convince people that it's a good idea to have this energy transition. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, now we can go to you, Sabine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you get my First slide, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I'm stepping in for the mayor of Reykjavik here and representing the Reykjavik City Council here for you. But, uh, but myself, uh, you might think that that name does not sound very Icelandic. Um, actually, I'm German. I was born and raised just about two hours drive from Ilmenau um, in Hessen. Um, but I've lived in Iceland for 20 years. Uh, that's a long story, of course, how I got from Hintersteinau, 25 kilometers south of Fulda, to the city council in, in Reykjavik. But um, uh, what maybe is important is that I come from activism myself into politics. That was my road in Iceland. Uh, when I moved here, I was uh, very quickly getting involved with a uh, different issue that we're dealing with here today, though uh, Jens was. Uh, um, uh, mentioning it, um, uh, th th and that's migration. I, I used to be uh, very active on immigrant issues, migrant, particularly migrant women, and from that I sort of accidentally slided into into politics. Um, I'm currently member of the city council, member of the environment and health council. Um, that's why I'm here, vice president of the city council. So I'm my speaker of the, the council. And I'm chair of an intercultural council and last but not least of procurement and construction. That doesn't sound very exciting, but actually that's the one thing where I can really make a difference. Um, I'm dealing with contract uh, contractors. I'm dealing with um, what carbon footprint do constructions in the city. And that's the biggest thing in the city, what you're building, both the roads, the um, school buildings and all that. So I'm, involved there. The picture I chose is one of my favorite spots in Iceland and it sort of tells maybe the story that that my um, going between the cultures and, and, and politics and activism is, is about. I mean it's it's a rare place in Iceland where you can find actually a bit of a forest. Um, they're not they're they're not very common in Iceland and that's the weak point. That's what I bring from Germany to Iceland that that we need more more trees in Iceland. Um, but then again, um, you sit in that uh, forest and you have uh, a warm spring to warm your feet. So that's just about me. Um, uh, and uh, maybe the next slide. But that would um, maybe be something I'd, I'd be happy to share how this road and transition went from being an activist in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, and going into practical um, politics. Uh, that, that is a challenge. But it's also a very interesting thing uh, happening and um, um, I hope might encourage people. Reykjavik is the capital of Iceland, 64 degrees north. Um, I very often see smiles on people's faces when I say 135,000 people. It's uh, not, not that much. 
But um, I mean, the whole of Iceland is as large as the the, the uh, former East Germany. Um, but uh, two thirds of the population, more than two hundred thousand, um, are um, concentrated in that small area there. So, so that area is actually quite densely populated. Uh, we are the lucky ones, um, and um, you might I might sound like bragging a lot about how lucky we are, but but that also tells a story maybe that that um, more countries can learn from. Um, geothermal heat, central heating is used here in every house and has been for a long time. I mean, it's so abundant. We're, I'm not joking, we're heating the pavements around our house so we don't have to shovel snow um, in the winter. Um, electricity production is 100% renewable from geothermal energy plus hydropower. Uh, we also have a very technologically open population. People are ready to embrace change. Uh, 45% of all new cars are non-fossil fuel cars. That's, uh, I think, number two in the world. Uh, I, the picture, I apologize for the, the quality of the pictures, but it's it's something um, I just took on my phone the other day on the way home. That's an active volcano we have in our backyard at the moment, but maybe tells the story about that this place is, of course, um, rather unusual, but has some special features that I think um, are very relevant in our debate here today. Next one, please. Thank you, yeah. And that would be a bit of my focus here is what a city um, can do in the context we're discussing today. Um, a lot of that, that has been mentioned by my predecessor here um, is, is this, uh, how, do you, how do we translate what we want to change. How do, do we translate climate action into practical, um, um, well, what's what's happening today in, in, in the place where we live? And where's the connection to what activism is about, what, active, what kind of change is bringing? We have a very low carbon footprint, but still not low enough. Um, we have a concrete goal of being carbon neutral by 2040. And we've just introduced what we call a green deal, the city's green deal, and that is uh, how we both how we are also going to use this situation now, getting out of Corona, rebuilding, restructuring society, restructuring economy. Um, how can we use that opportunity, that window, where I think also people are very open to change now. They are open to revalue. Um, a lot of things. So we have to translate this into something that I would call a win-win concept, where climate action in the urban context is also means for the people that it might be good for their health, for their quality of life, and even for the economy. Thank you. Thank you so, Thank much. You so much, Seth. And, and the Yana the spotlight is yours. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, also I'm very happy to be here and having this discussion. Um, yeah, I'm Jana. I'm here today because um, I'm an activist with Fridays for Future and the climate justice movement. Um, I sometimes struggle a bit with like the term activist. What does that mean to me? Um, but for me, that means that I spend a lot of time organizing, campaigning and demonstrating with Fridays for Future. Uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm studying math in the city of Jena, not so far away from, from Ilmenau. Um, yeah, and I thought because I was here today to talk about activism, I, I'd tell you a bit how what was my way to come to activism. Um, I'm 20 years old today. I started around five years ago to become um, politically organized, but like in my childhood, like I always went to demonstrations with my parents and I think I was a very political kid. Um, I started, I climate or climate justice never really was my topic. Um, I started more around um, being involved in the topics of youth participation and youth parliaments um, and also around the concept more of justice. I'm more from the, I always say more from the justice side from climate justice than climate. Um, yeah, but then um, after I'd finished high school, um, I spent, a, I did a European voluntary service for one year in Greece, which is um, sometimes why I, I get this fake Greek accent. So don't wonder if uh, I put this accent is <laughs> my fake Greek accent. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I fall back to that sometimes. Um, and in that year, 
um, when I was in Greece, that was the year when Fridays for Future was founded in 2018. And while I was seeing my, my old friends from school um, going to talk shows, talking with politicians in Germany and organizing mass demonstrations, I was in Greece and Greece didn't really have a climate justice movement at the time. Um, and that that was like a point where I was questioning, like, what do I want to do? And do I want to continue this youth participation thing? Or do I want to um, be part of the movement that actually gives youth a voice um, at the moment? And yeah, that's how, how I joined Fridays for Future. I think you can go to the next slide, Maria. Yeah, perfect. For those of you who don't know Fridays for Future, uh, in some countries it maybe has different names, like School Strike for Climate or Youth for Climate. Um, in 2018, this movement was founded um, around the concept of school strikes, um, kids striking school, not going to school, um, to draw attention to the topic of climate of, of the climate crisis. Um, and what started with like a single person has turned into a global students movement um, and impresses me day after day um, what this movement can organize. Um, it's uh, we are very decentralized, we are organized very decentralized. Um, for example, in Germany, we have local groups in 500 cities, or not even cities sometimes, <laughs> because it's so many. Um, and we have national and international networks to coordinate our work and to do these big global climate strikes, um, where we yeah, used to do mass demonstrations and mass mobilizations, like in September 2019, when we, uh, on one single day, um, in 185 countries, we had 7 million people on the street for climate justice, demonstrating for climate justice, um, which is, yeah, I think impressed me a lot as like um, a, a political child who always uh, was not so sure what young people can do and what is our young people's place in politics. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, I think we we organized some some rather rather big demonstrations and I, a bit our motto has always been listen to the science like there has been knowledge for the climate crisis for for years for 40 years there has been enough knowledge around the climate crisis to tackle it um, but somehow politics doesn't address it and that was kind of the point where we started this movement can you go to the next slide um, yeah but then um, our two main pillars of Fridays for Future mass demonstration and the narration of the climate crisis is the worst crisis we're facing in this century were kind of a bit difficult to hold up on during corona um, which is why i chose a few pictures here um, to show you how our process has changed during corona um, because of course we cannot have mass demonstrations anymore during a pandemic um, which is why um, we our protests got more creative and um, we, we did more campaigns on specific topics, like for example, fossil gas. Um, yeah, and that's a bit um, what I do in my activism and what my movement Fred is the Future does, yeah. Thank you so much. I, sorry, I, I was just trying the microphone because we have some digital issues, but it's cool. Thank you so much for your time. And now we're going to start with our little panel discussion. And um, like we said, the first topic that we are going to talk about is um, climate change in, in the political grounds. And we want to know from your part, um, how do you see it? How do you think politics are addressing the current climate change issues? I think maybe we can start with Sabine, that is the one that works um, in, in the city. <laughs> so you can give us your point of view. But I think it's really interesting that we have, for example, Professor Bolling, that he researches about how to communicate this topic. And also, Jana, that you are young and you see it from the point of view that it's going to affect your future. And maybe um, also to, to touch the topic, OK, what can we do as citizens um, with, with the politics? How can we get more involved or how can we change it? Um, Sabine. Sorry. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm in politics, so I'm the one to blame. Um, we are the ones to blame. That's uh, <laughs> that's um, maybe the easy shot. But no, um, I think the point is a bit 
how do we translate? How do we translate um, the huge issue that is so monumental that we could just can't grasp it? The everyday person has a problem grasping what, what's really happening, what the danger is and, and what has to be done. And uh, I feel a lot of what we hear in global news, because we're talking about global and, and, and what's happening local. I think what happens in global news is, is, is of a dimension that we have a problem translating it to our daily existence and into municipal action and, and all that. And it seems that, that it's all about the huge agreements, the, the, the Paris Agreement and, and, and uh, international agreements. And um, we have, I think it's, it's very, very difficult for people to, to um, move that over and um, not making it about the local things, the things that both countries can do on a national la level, how they can support technology, how can they um, put the legal framework for waste reduction, for energy renewal um, and, and all that. And how can that then be translated into municipal action? What can, what can a city do? Um, we are focusing in Reykjavik at the moment on, on transport. That's a big, big issue, how we can turn that, that huge ship that, that was once uh, uh, constructed as a city for cars with loads of space, no problem about that, into a densified modern city that works on public transport. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going down all, all those steps. Um, and uh, I think that that is the main challenge, how we can translate that huge thing that seems so unsurmountable. What, what do 1.5 degrees mean, really? If, if, but um, if, and, and I think the challenge for activism and politics is to translate that down into action and to the people that they can really see what it means. And again, I, I said I, we're, we're incredibly lucky in so many things here in Iceland with the renewable energy and all that. But we also here in, a, in, a, in an area where we can see directly out of our window what's happening. Um, we've seen glaciers disappearing completely. Last year, we, we no, the year before last, we said goodbye to a glacier. It was gone. Um, I have pictured to when, when I came first to Iceland of a glacial um, uh, lake. And today, yesterday in the news, there was a report on a little island there on that lake. That lake wasn't there. Uh, that, that island wasn't there 30 years ago. The whole island that just wasn't there. And just before Christmas, my two oldest kids were in a fjord in, in the east of Iceland, at just 200 meters away from a huge mudslide that came in, in, in after um, unprecedented rainfall. So we are very close. We can see it. Um, but we also have, of course, that, that challenge to, to translating again. And actually, I've worked as a translator um, for a long time, translating that, what people see, what is happening, into into action that is doable. Yep, that was my <laughs> first input. Some other speaker wants to say uh, something um, to question Sabine or has another point of view? I just can totally agree. I'm at the moment also working uh, in, in the local, uh, local, not say government, in the local uh, political area, and it's really, really difficult. Uh, we are also working on uh, in decisions on how to improve schools and uh, the issue uh, of well, how to um, to 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 integrate also these aspects of um, well renewable energies for example yeah? or uh, to to build the, the schools from the beginning as uh, as uh, climate as climate appropriate uh, climate adapted uh, houses uh, or also how to save uh, construction material or to use the right construction material from the region and not always uh, well um, well, the, the traditional well, traditional forms uh, that are now used uh, in construction, that's really a really hard issue. It's really very, very difficult to make these changes. 
And I think it's so important to have these, um, to, to be get involved on this local level and to, to actually changing things on a local level. But I think, um, it's always important to keep the big picture in mind. And this is like everything we don't do now will be, we will have to do in the future and it will get even, if you will have even less time and will, and it will be even less comfortable to do it in the future. So it's so important that we act now and that we act very quickly. Um, and, there is a lot of things to think through and to change. Um, and it's very important, um, I think, that there's a political framework for that uh, in which the climate friendly action is the easy action um, and the climate unfriendly action is the difficult action. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a lot of work. But I think because we have solutions, there, there is solutions for the problems we are facing. Um, yeah, that's that's the task now to, to put it into work. And I'm... Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to be in your place, Sabine. <laughs> um, perhaps I might might add something. Um, for me, the question we I think Sabine, it was very important that you said that now the moment that people are willing to do some changes. Um, um, we did. A, I mentioned this research that we did on Corona. Yeah, and we also include in this uh, research we asked them uh, if they are if they think that we should use this chance to do some changes. And there was an overwhelming agreement that people said, yes, we should, ch should change something. And then the next time we, we was a panel study, so we asked them, what should we change? And we had uh, different items, and uh, then we did an analysis, and we found, okay, there are three dimensions. One, uh, that's uh, fortunately is a very small group, who said, okay, uh, stop migration, get out of the EU. So these very, very right-wing uh, attitudes that said, okay, that's how the future should look like. And then we had two groups, big groups, and one said, okay, we should go on as before, but make things better. And there was another group who said, okay, we should change. So we should change, uh, we should, um, what I would call the social, ecological change. So uh, social aspect and ecological aspects should change and must get better. But these two groups or these two ideas of going on in the same way as before, but make things better and really make a change, that's something what, at least in Germany, there is a struggle at the moment. And also from a scientific perspective, I would say, okay, there is a, a, um, the expectation that well, on the one hand side, science, um, shows us the problem, but also science will give the solution. So scientific progress will help us to overcome the problems. And uh, that's a, the one group, and I wouldn't say even the group, that's one idea, perhaps all of us have this somehow in mind, so that we believe, okay, it would be nice uh, if we could go on in some ways with the, the life as we know, and it's a, it's a very common idea at the moment to say, okay, we would like to have our our lives back as before yeah? and life back as before as well go to to the philippines or go to mallorca wherever in the world and to have vacations and all these things yeah as before and the other idea is okay we should and there are also a big advantages of doing these changes but this is uh, i think that we have to keep in mind when we talk about well change what means change for the people and it's for me, it's, at least, it's not decided how to convince people that really these more fundamental changes, from my perspective, are necessary and uh, also good changes. Uh, but not everybody is convinced. And it's difficult. But this next question goes directly at you, Jana. Um, from your perspective in politics, are there enough laws and are there enough regulations now uh, for the environment? Do you think um, in Germany, because you you are you're based in in Germany, are here? Do you think there are enough or should there be more? No, <laughs> short answer: no. <laughs> I mean, there are regulations, there are laws, but they are not at all sufficient. Um, like we have like this coal exit law. Uh, which which says we we will um, end um, burning fossil fossil coal by uh, 2038, and there is this law, but this is not at all compatible with the Paris Agreement. Um, 
so we definitely no <laughs> we are not in any situation where the laws meet the reality of the climate crisis i'd say and um we were talking for example um it's good to have sabine in the conversation because the next question i can think of is um i know it's hard to make the 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 whole um for example town city Uh, people, uh, young people, adult people to keep going with the change because we know that with change there comes a little bit of, of fear. Um, and how fast should the change be or how fast can actually change be? Like um, from, from your um, perspective, for example, um, starting a law and then how, how fast can, can you put a, um, an environmental law out there? Mm -hmm. Um, again, um, I'm lucky here in Iceland. Um, I, the, I, the Icelandic society is very adaptable and very mm -hmm. ready for change, um, very literate and open to technology and uh, ready to, to react quickly. I think mm -hmm. that's a bit... That's a bit based on the, on the nature here. You have to react quickly, um, always. You, you only have three months of summer, so you have to do the whole hay uh, for the winter. So that, that that's all you have. And um, so people are ready to react also with natural disasters and, and um, things like that. So you have a population that is well educated. And that is, I think, a very important uh, uh, um, issue. If you have a, a population that is not technically literate, um, then it'll be much more of a challenge to bring about changes. Uh, and then again, I agree with Jana that we both in Germany and, and here in Iceland, the regulation, more regulation is needed. But you always need that balance of getting people along. And, and there are many more um, tools that you can use. I mean, we're For example, we work a lot with uh, the price structure of, of your waste bins. I mean, that is a very, very simple thing. But if you, if you do not recycle, if you do not uh, separate your waste, and, and if you produce a lot of non-recyclable waste, then you pay more. That's it. Um, so the, so the, it always has to be a, a balance from, from regulations, um, then using all the tools you can In, in, in that respect, but also getting people on, on that wagon. And maybe it's also a thing, and that's something that we, we try to do with this Green Deal at this point in time, um, it has to be sustainable. And that means, I know it's a fashion word, but it means um, if you threaten to take people's jobs, by shutting down a non-environmental friendly industry, you have to provide alternatives, jobs in, in industries that are um, either working with uh, renewable energy or, or, or somewhere else. I mean, you have to, to uh, the whole thing has to, to add up. And, um from from my point of view because i um i am an exchange student i i finished my bachelor degrees in ilmenau but i come from guatemala and guatemala is still a developing country so maybe my question for you all is how do you see it um from this side of the game that you are advanced um do you see it more that that locally and globally should for example um iceland that is already really advanced Um, should keep moving on and and be like the example for other countries or should it be like more like a force a political force that you advance like together like um, because at the end the movement should be global to to work because if you have like really nice cities in Europe that are working uh, really uh, without waste like for example when you hear of of, of Sweden that it's really magical And then you go um, to my country where, for example, we burn, we burn the, the trash. Um, but uh, with politics, it's really difficult because there are people dying of hunger. And then you should concentrate also on climate change. But you have like a, a list of priorities. Um, do you, from your experience, uh, I'm asking all the three of you, um, 
do you think the movement would be better if it's like all countries at the same time or should the countries that can like move forward and and be the example i think it's very important um I, I think it will not be possible to to move everyone at the same time, but it's so important that the rich countries and I think like in Germany and Iceland, we're very privileged to have the means and the financial means to to take climate action, that they support the countries um, who cannot. And it's also very important to see that in history, the countries that have caused the most pollution are Europe and North America, probably. Um, And is not the countries, the developing countries now, who have caused the most um, uh, emissions in in the in the past. So I think it's very important to keep that in mind, and that is something that the Paris Agreement does. Um, in 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 parts, you can argue if it's enough. Um, but I think this is a very imp important principle of of global rights uh, to to take into account. And um, I think I've said it in the introduction round. I've lived one year in Greece and I can uh, I think even from this per perspective I can say that it's not all of Europe that is advancing in climate in climate mitigation um, laws and processes and transformation like I talked to many young people in Greece and it's of course it's also their future and it's going their future is probably going to be affected much more severely than German youth future but when everything you're worrying about is how can you get enough money to make it through the month then you're not worrying a lot about climate change and i think that's a very normal thing so i don't think it's all about the literacy and how much do you know about climate change but it's also about how much can you afford to think about climate change and how much um yeah I, do you have the privilege to think so far in the future um so from this perspective i think it's very important to support one another in the world and that the rich countries and the globalized countries um also think about the whole world and not just their cities. Yeah. Um, I could add maybe um, that that it's um, what the rich countries or what the more developed countries or, or just say the lucky countries like Iceland. I mean, it's not my uh it's 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 just happened so that we have geothermal e heat i mean we just uh, stumbled on it more or less here in, in in iceland we just dig a hole in the ground and you have hot water um uh, but so so we're just we're just lucky um but um i think it it is then our duty to share what we have and we for example i just um one example i've been looking into a lot is technology we can export and a knowledge we can utilize um, with I mean there is of course a, a lot of uh, knowledge here on geothermal energy and and fossil and non uh, uh, renewable energy um, hydropower um, <clears throat> and we have uh, a, a company here called uh, carfix it's it's an affiliate of a, a city um, city the city's energy Uh, um procurement com company and uh, they have developed an amazing technology of uh, basically I, I'll, i'll simplify it um, I'm, not, i'm not a scientist myself but i simplify you you find uh, you have a, a power plant here a geothermal power plant which produces very concentrated carbon dioxide this carbon dioxide you can um uh, um dissolve in water so basically like a soda stream to put it very simple um, and then you pressure you 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 uh, press that water down very deep down into the rock formations that are there and there the carbon dioxide is mineralized um, so this is not carbon dioxide storage which is very de heat uh, debated because there, there are a lot of risks we actually can bind carbon dioxide into uh, stone so turning carbon di dioxide into rocks um, that sounds magic and and it's it's not as easy um, in in practice you need a lot of conditions to be met you need basalt uh, the right rock formations you need a lot of water um, so it's it's not 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 that easy but it's both knowledge that uh, we are now looking into exporting i think there are, are, are negotiations both with germany and turkey to introduce that technology there um, and uh, 
we're even looking into importing carbon dioxide in concentrated form to Iceland to 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 work that because that that can bind carbon dioxide for thousands of years. Um, that is uh, so. So I think um, it's it's our duty if we have the technology and the means and the opportunities to to put that support out there. Definitely. Talking about, for example, now that you mentioned industry and how to move forward, um, we had a question in the um, in the chat. In your opinion, which one should be priority? Building strong economy, building a strong economy, or keeping the with sorry, mm -hmm. building a strong economy with more industry building, or slow it down to the, to reduce emission. <laughs> For me, this is a crucial point. So this is these are two these are two perspectives that I mentioned at the very beginning. And so Sabina said is one of the in, in the, the direction, okay, we can manage this with uh, new technologies. Uh, and I'm working at the moment really in the project that uh, tries to uh, to communicate these developments in, in Germany, uh, hydrogen, especially in the hydrogen technologies, and also carbon to chem. So a similar approach, not uh, storage in the ground, but using the, the carbon from carbon dioxide to produce to make chemical products so using this uh, well, solving the problem uh, in, a, in a different way this for me this is one approach and probably we have to go it in a, until a certain way but the question for me at least the question remains is this the whole picture or uh, would it be better to uh, be more creative concerning a, really a better future so I ask myself when I when I look at the production of the uh, of the production that we have in Europe and also in other parts of the world, we are producing so many things. And why do we are producing so many things? Uh, because they are not of high quality. We waste them. We don't use them for a lot of time. We don't recycle them. So there are a lot of of questions, and we produce and produce and produce. And if someone says, "Okay, we should do, we shouldn't do that," and says, "Okay, but the jobs." What will the people do who lose jobs? Uh, so it's uh, that's a question. So for me, uh, I think we have to really to think about another future where work, where we work. Well, when I when I think of economy, the aim of economy is to satisfy our needs, not to 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 get jobs. <laughs> this all this discussion of we need jobs is somehow the wrong one. It's not about jobs. It's about satisfying our needs and satisfying our needs in the best way. And therefore, I think the creativity or the creativity of, uh, of, of science, economic science, of, uh, has to go in, in this direction to say, OK, how, how could we manage uh, our world? How could we manage our economies? Um, not think always, OK, we will lose a job, so we need a new job. I think there's a lot of things to do. So if we look of health care, if we look of the care of older people, a lot of work and people are working really, really hard. So the question is, do we need to produce always something new? Yeah, there's also, I, I won't say there is, there is a lot of things. There are a lot of needs. If I think of Guatemala, I, have, I lived for two years in Nicaragua. I think situation is quite similar there. So I know that people, we're talking about different le levels of standard of living and there has to be improved a lot. But um, I don't think it's, it's uh, the aim could be, okay, uh, let's, Let's waste as we are wasting here in, in Europe or in, in, in the United States. There should be another perspective, yeah, another perspective how the future should look like. Yeah. Something think, to add? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think from to me the question is a bit about is is there something as green growth? And I'd say no, there is not. There cannot be green growth. Um, because I think of course, it's amazing to see these technological advancements to not store CO2, but to make it as rocks and these things, it's amazing. But when we look at the past, these technology improvements or these improvements in efficiency have never led to humanity producing or emitting emitting less carbon dioxide. It's always been used to, to 
be able to produce more or to um, build bigger things. Like, for example, with cars, like if we be driving the same cars as we were in 1980, um, the efficiency of the motors have, has evolved so much that we would be emitting way less than we are now. But instead of using these efficiency improvements um, to emit less, they are being used to sell even bigger cars. And this is this paradox, it's like rebound effects. I think we will be facing with every technology improvement we are, we are going to, to do in the future. And I think for this reason, it's so important to actually tackle this transformation and not just hope for um, technological advancement or for um, the industry to come up with um, so, some innovation because um, the industry is not is in the first place is not in, interested in having in having a long term uh, solution to a problem, but just to maximizing their personal growth. And this is not how climate change or the climate climate crisis is working. Absolutely. Can I add something? Um, I per absolutely agree that that uh, um, there is no quick fix, and technology will not be the quick fix for uh, for any of our our challenges here. Um, you always have to have multi faceted um, approaches, and um, the, I mentioned that that our biggest challenge is transport and uh, private car usage here because as i said the city of Reykjavik was um created it's it, the city center is a, is on a peninsula and uh, when people started moving more and more into the city it started to span out like a fan so more and more people living further and further away um and that's something public transport of course can't cover so that's the challenge that we have and um our approach is now both to densify the city so people do not have to have uh, so many cars um, and we can provide what we call bus rapid uh, transport system so where everyone should have access to to a, a, um, a bus station within like 500 meters and that includes also a concept of uh, what we call the 15 minute um, uh, concept that that everything you really need for your daily life should be reachable by foot within 15 minutes so so services green areas and and, and everything so so it's that and that also means um it uh, what i mentioned earlier it needs to add up uh, for sustainability, for real change, it needs to add up, it needs to work for us on a personal level. And that, what I just described, if we manage, we haven't yet, we're not there yet, we're working on it, but we're not there yet. If we can provide a, a, a city, an urban context where maybe every family would have maximum one car, not like, I'm not joking, three or four, as is the reality for people living here, in, in the suburbs, um, then that, of course, would also mean it works for them because, I mean, cars cost an enormous amount of money. So that that would be um, what I would call the win-win concept. You have to make it work. It has to mean uh, a huge change of consumerism. Um, and I think that that refers to what you say, what you're saying, Jana. We, 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 technology will not be a quick fix for anything, um, but we have to change the environment, the, the the context, the urban context where we're living, in order to make it a good thing for people to stop having it, all those cars. And that's again, and and another, it's it's good for your health also, and the economy. Thank you so much. Um, to mix this last topic um, of political and to mix the next topic that is activism, we have from the uh, Discord uh, participants a question that goes directly to Jana, but then we can uh, apply it in other perspectives. But this participant wrote, I have seen various demonstrations on climate change in Germany. I would like to ask if you have achieved any specific achievements through the demonstrations. I think that's a good question that we're asking ourselves a lot. Um, I think the main thing is that we really influence the public discourse and that climate, climate topics are not anymore something you talk about in five minutes at the very end of your talk, but climate is the topic. And 
I think especially in Germany, like in or when we when we were seeing the European elections, climate um, was an election deciding topic, and I think this is what at least partly or to a big extent came through these demonstrations, and I think um, in the extent that both media and politics is interested to to talk to Fridays for Future as a movement, I think we're seeing that we're having an influence, and even when. I mean, we put we put forward demands to the police to the politics, but even when those have not been met yet, I think we still achieved a lot by influencing the public discourse and also the discourse in Parliament. Thank you. Um, now, connecting to activism, maybe this question to uh, Professor Volling: How meaningful, effective is digital activism, or have you 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 have researched it in some different? areas. Could you tell us um, a little bit about this? Okay. Uh, my, my first of all, well, I would like to add something different. Um, mm -hmm. But first, I totally I totally agree. I think that uh, Fridays for Future put the issue on the agenda and that was very, very important. So I think there is no doubt about that. Uh, that's, that's, that's true. Um, about digital um, activism, I think it's also a necessary tool. Yeah, so today uh, it's almost impossible to to organize such uh, such events without the digital tools. Uh, I think we also agree that it, if it just takes place in the digital world, it's not enough. You need you need somehow these. I think uh, Greenpeace called them these bearing witnesses. So people who do something, who are willing to, yeah, well, to engage, uh, and not only uh, online but also on the streets or somewhere else uh, in, in activities. I think this is uh, this is also important. Um, my my point was a, a total different one that I would like to add is. Um, we do, uh, we did, and I'm doing at the moment research on an activism from the other side. So uh, the protests that take place, uh, especially in Germany, at the moment it's especially the, the wind turbines. So in any place in Germany, when you want to to, to build a turbine, uh, you don't have to wait a day. There will be uh, yeah, a civil initiative or uh, a civil society initiative. And organizing protests against these activities. And that's really a big, big issue. And it's also, uh, we, would, we have to, to, to agree that it's also uh, participation from the citizens. And we have to handle this kind of participation. So we always have these two sides yeah, of, of participation. And uh, in the moment, it's really, really difficult to, um, yeah, to, to, to build wind turbines in Germany, and we know, yeah, so all these other changes, yeah, at least in Germany and in, in Ireland, in, in Iceland, it's, it's different because you have these natural resources, yeah, so you have to dig just a hole in the ground and you have the resources here in Germany, and um, the big struggles how to, uh, to get the energy, yeah, and uh, all these other processes of hydrogen, of carbon to chem, all these processes need a lot of energy, yeah, electric energy. And so the question is how to produce, how to, you know, how to, where to get this energy from. And there's really a lot of, um, yeah, we have to convince these people. Yeah. And it's really, really hard because uh, some of them are organized. So there, there are political interests behind that. But also, there are, especially here in Thuringia, I know I talk with a lot of them. They are really concerned about their environment, about their home, of their, their the countryside. You know, it's not. It's not. Uh, some are really political activists, no doubt. So they are, they have another agenda behind. Uh, but some of them are really concerned, and you really have to know, to talk with them, to convince them, and uh, offer them and make explain them uh, why it's so necessary and it's difficult. It's really, really difficult. People um, frequently have no ideas, have no ideas. Yeah, They have no ideas about the problems. They just heard about that. And even worse, they have no, about, no idea about the solutions. So what could be the solutions? Yeah, 
that's uh, yeah it's a big task and uh, yeah well, i think we, uh, that this will be the the second task second task one is uh, mobilizing activists yeah so that's what friday for futures did successfully fortunately uh, but the other side is uh, convince all the people who are who are not well informed who are skeptical about the the, the technologies they are concerned yeah concerned uh, about the technologies um well And um, on a personal point of view, um, Professor Bolling, talking and thinking about the news, I think um, it was mentioned at, at, at the start of the conversation of the panel discussion. Do you think the responsibility is more of the citizens and the population to be informed about the issues or the material or what um what process can you do to be more greener or what can you not do like for example i i didn't thought about all this wind that you like for example that in iceland you have the natural um sources to do it but in germany not that i didn't know so do you think it's a more like a responsibility of the citizens to get informed or or is like a mixture also from the media that media should also do good news and, and inform the people for example i i thought maybe if they inform a little bit more locally then you wouldn't have always in mind the big picture so oh yeah the politicians are not doing anything the councilor is not doing anything um but maybe i i think it's also responsibility from the citizen to get involved locally uh, for example in an organization and then you you are there but maybe Also, the media, uh, should, should they change the way they talk about um, climate change and activism? Uh, <laughs> my idea is a little bit different. I mm -hmm. have the idea that none of us, mm -hmm. not the politicians, not the media, takes the issue really, into, really serious. Yeah? Uh, I have the impression when I when I observe the news, we have sometimes very well-informed journalists. We have very informative reports about climate change. Yeah, at, uh, really, really on a high level, uh, very good. Yeah, you find all these these kind of news in the media, all this kind of background information. It's fine, but then. It changed, and then the next the next news piece is about problems in the in the industry. So that there is something okay. We have a problem with selling cars. Yeah. So uh, we have to improve uh, that Germany uh, has to um, sell more cars in China. Or um, perhaps it's not a problem. They say okay, oh, German industry is very successful in selling cars in China or wherever in the world. And it's without the context. So something that in the end, within the context of climate change, is a problem, yeah, is in the next news piece covered as a success or as a problem, but not as a problem for the environment, but as a problem for the economy. And for me, these, these things are not connected. Yeah? So on the one hand side, we have this very good information, but on the other side, And sometimes it's, it's like if this problem doesn't really exist. Yeah? So we are talking about problems that in the context of climate change should be covered differently. So we would say, okay, if we don't sell so much cars in China, well, it's a, at the moment it's an economical problem for Germany, but the problem couldn't be how to sell more cars in China. The problem has to be solved in another way. And this, this is not the context. And uh, frequently, and I have the impression that neither the politicians nor the media really takes this issue so serious as it is. If the scientists, climate scientists are right, and if Greta Thunberg is right with what she said, as our house is burning, our house, house is on fire. If our house is on fire, 
we have to care about other things. We don't care about the curtains or we don't care if the floor, floor is wrapped. Uh, so we, uh, uh, there are other things. Um, that's my impression that, that these these two that that that, that are the different aspects in politics and the different aspects in the media are not well connected, not well connected. And therefore, I have the impression that okay, so how should people who hear the news, who listen to the news, who watch the radio, who listen to the radio, uh, read the newspapers, why should they be able to connect these things differently? If not even the politicians or not even the media do it in this way. My my idea. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Sabine or Jana, something to add here? Yeah, maybe that that was an interesting point um, that you just mentioned there. Um, and I think we could maybe transfer what, well, not all of us, but a lot of people have learned to, um, we, we use that expression in gender politics a lot, that we need those glasses. We need to put up the gender glasses and everything, whether we're looking at literature or, uh, or, or recycling, doesn't matter. You, 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 and, and climate change has a lot of gender politics, of course, very different for, for, for men and women, particularly in, in some countries, um, that, that we, we have to transfer that knowledge on as as you just said we have to put on the, the climate change glasses um for for everything we're doing that's right yeah and that that goes for so many things i mean whatever issue um that w activists are taking up whether it's gender politics whether it's environment whether it's um uh, migrants uh, this the same thing we need to to um, have a more holistic approach Thank you. Um, now that you mentioned the metaphor of glasses, I think um, when you put on the glasses, that's a lot of stress. That's a lot of, uh, okay, my house is burning. So um, this question goes to Jana. Um, I think it's really interesting from here, from your perspective, how you get people to activate. How do you, what are the, um, the, um, techniques that you use, for example, as a Fridays for Future, to get people to put on the glasses, um, but not like with this therapy of shock, like not telling people maybe because I think it's more effective if you do it in a, in a positive way than doing it in the negative way. The negative way is easier, but then psychologically you're blocked. So um, could you tell us your secret? I think for a very long time, we didn't even have to think about that because mm -hmm. We were trying to reach out to young people, to students, okay. and mm -hmm. most students are very well informed about the, about the issue of climate change and, and clim the climate crisis. Um, so for the longest time, that was nothing we were thinking about because our target group was very much on our side and very eager to, to come and demonstrate and strike with us. Um, but then eventually we reached a point where we tried to reach out to groups that are not the students that think the same way we do but to other groups in society. Um, and I think it's, um, it's very important to take on different perspectives. So like for us, as people who go to school, who study in university, it's not like we are not the person who worked for 30 years in the car factory. And that's a different perspective. And it's important to be able to take on that perspective and to have an argumentation from, from that perspective. But it's still very important that things things change in our society um and but then finally i think when we're talking about the climate crisis we can't really talk without fear because that's in the end that's a very scary thing that will happen and it's i don't think it's possible to um i mean you can of course try to encounter it with hope and um the hope of a transformation and a world where we can hopefully live more or less peacefully a few more years um But then again, this is also just like a thinking of avoiding the fearful thing. So I think actually um, the climate crisis is very fearful, so we can't communicate without fear. Okay, so yeah, thank you for your recommendation is to be responsible. I think to make everyone aware that they are also responsible um, and activate. 
So, yeah, it's um, it's it's a big topic. I'm always impressed. That's why you can see it in my eyes. <laughs> um, moving to the next question from um, our Discord chat. Um, but how can we involve also people who work for 30 years in a card company, for example? I mean, these people also have an interest to live a few more years. It's not like it's not like they're going to be happy about a scenario with the climate crisis when we're facing um, huge hunger issues and wars on water and gigantic migration movements. That's not a world anyone wants to live in. Um, so in the end, it's in all of our interest um, to tackle the climate crisis and to find adequate solutions. And the important thing is that when we're talking about solutions, that we're including these people in the solutions, that these people who have knowledge on how to how to make cars also have knowledge on how to make buses or on how to make other things. Um, so this is a very important thing. And then we can talk about um, the four day week or 30 hour week. And we have to become creative in the solutions and have to think f about other perspectives and then I think we've had in the past, um, we've had cooperation with industry movements who were also on our side and were asking um, their head of industries to, to give them um, a framework in which they can develop climate friendly solutions for their branch of industry. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's my take. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we should also not be too prejudiced about certain groups. Um, uh, I, I'm i always happy when my own prejudices are, are, are challenged and I just recalled a, a, an incident when I was last campaigning before elections, I was sent to an old people's home and um, I did my homework and prepared and, and got all the brochures of what we're doing for elderly people and the, the social benefits and all that. So I was ready with my speech on, on, on old people. But when I arrived there, they were like, oh, we don't care at all about that. What are you doing for the young people? We want to know what you're doing for our grandchildren. So um, I think that that is also and maybe also connecting to what we discussed before. Um, we have to establish more communication between those these different groups. Jana, you mentioned you you're usually talking to to, to the convert you're preaching to the converted very often it happens to me very much that I, i'm just talking to my own bubble and um, maybe not reaching out to the people i should reach and i want to reach out and that also again um, um uh, goes uh, maybe concerns the media um i think it is very uh, we very often of course consume a certain group of media certain certain technology and there is very often not enough transfer between those different media that younger people use, older people use, different political interest groups use. And um, so I think we, we need much more transfer be between these groups and between different kinds of media. Yeah, I, I think how you say, Sabine, at the, at the beginning that we have to search how to translate the different um, messages uh, for, for the different people. And also some truth that you said, and here Professor Bolling uh, will not let me lie, I don't remember the name of the theory in communication, but it's often that people, when they're in this bubble, um, you get like confirmed the information because you are like stuck in in the, the things that you read and then your opinion is always getting stronger because you're always reading and um, it's uh, accepting, uh, accepting your opinion like once again and you just only read like this side of, of, of the picture and you don't like fold it or see it around. So um, uh, also Professor Bolling, you mentioned uh, that you were making some studies about how to approach people that are also like the sound of climate change is so loud that you just reject the topic. Um, could you tell maybe um, here as a as a um, um, as a technique to Jana, how could she go with this kind of people that reject the topic? Like you say, climate change, and they really give you like this horrible um, speech that oh yeah. Uh, I am already 60, I'm not going to live in this world that long. <laughs> and you're like... 
actually, I use that advice too. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't get the question. Uh, the last um, one from Sabina. From Sabina. From Sabina, what I'm she said. Uh, no, I just thought I could use that kind of advice too. <laughs> um, okay. Um, the problem is, I, I perhaps I, I, I didn't know if I promised too much. The, the, the issue is that it's about issue fatigue. Issue fatigue means that people are interested in the topic, are open to it, but when it comes again and again and again and again, that they get bored. And that they, after a while, they don't want to hear any more about that. Yeah? And then the question is, what can we do? And I think, uh, and, and what we at least found until now is that this, that you have to bring variants, variants in, into, the, into the coverage. So you have to connect the issue with different, with different aspects. Yeah? Uh, look at it from different sides. So that they don't have the impression that it's really always the same. That, that's one important aspect. The other aspect is, and perhaps that's, that was also a good thing for Fridays for Future. We know from, 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 um, from research that topics go up and down. So uh, climate, the climate issue was really up before Corona came. It was perhaps too much or too high on the agenda that people already started somehow to get a little bit bored from that. And now I see the big chance that, well, with Corona really slows down a little bit, that there is an opportunity to bring the climate crisis back on the agenda because the media and people are like that. So if something is too much, then they cover something different and people don't want to hear anything about that. So it's a chance. So you have to accept this. Yeah. So you don't have to be disappointed. Yeah. So if after a while you don't get through uh, with your issues, then you have to think, okay, we have to change it. We have to bring something, a new aspect, a new perspective on that uh, to make it interesting for the media and also for the people. Because people, if they have the impression, okay, I've heard this, yeah, so several times there, there's nothing new, then it's, then it's a problem. So this is one. The other thing is, uh, and that's a, the more demanding thing, is how to, uh, to reach people who have a, a different opinion. Uh, so we have this problem of the echo chambers, probably that's what you, you thought about, uh, the echo chambers. Um, there is some research that says, okay, these kind of problems exist, but... The big but is that also those, and we found this in the migration issue, we, we had this, uh, this observation that even those who really were totally against uh, that uh, refugees came to Germany were using the mass media, so the public television, uh, also qualitative newspapers. So there is always a chance to bring in other aspects. Uh, it's we don't know if they are observing just the, the other media to know what the others think and that they're not really interested in learning from, from the other sources. That's what we don't know. But at least um, the idea that they are totally separated spaces of the public for Germany, it's not true. It might be that in other countries it's, it's different, but at least in Germany, it's not like this. Even those who have very um, radical positions are at least watching, listening to the other side. Perhaps just to observe, <laughs> I don't know, or to learn. Uh, but sometimes, uh, well, even if you don't want to learn, you learn something. <laughs> okay. Thank you for, for, for your insights. And I got also a question here. Um, do you think, for example, fear uh, can uh, contribute to this fatigue or are fact different factors? The fear in, in the context of climate change. Can, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, not in the, how we conceptualized uh, uh, issue fatigue. It has to do with with emotions, yes, uh, but um, uh, the, the most important emotion is not fear. 
sometimes these emotions, yeah, like fear, can be connected with that in, in the context of uh, of issue fatigue. But fear is not the most important one. Concerning fear, perhaps in the context of climate change, uh, um, Jana mentioned that it's necessary yeah, to to address fear. Yes and no. <laughs> I think on the one hand side, if you are not aware that there is really something dangerous, uh, then it's uh, well, you won't do something. Yeah, so it's it's uh, necessary that you take the things serious. But I'm not sure if it's really fear. Uh, if we need fear, because fear is something that uh, somehow, um, yeah, if you really feel fear, you are unable to do something. So. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have uh, sometimes feel that when I've been in Nicaragua, uh, there was an attack from the Contra uh, and I was there and I felt fear and I was not able to do something in this moment. So fear really makes you unable to do things. And um, therefore, I would would not recommend to, to, to work with fear. Uh, and also the research on climate change says, there's a, a famous article that says, uh, fear won't do it. So be careful with fear, uh, take things serious, make clear that there is a serious issue, that's important, but well, okay, no fear. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe on this aspect, we can ask advice to um, Sabine, uh, that you said, for example, um, you said something about the accept acceptance of the citizens and, and that you as a city or as the council uh, have a great response and can encourage the people to to activate to be involved in the movement um what are here your techniques or strategies um how can we reach as um younger people this um encourage uh, encouragement or this acceptance from from these other groups of people how do you do it mm -hmm. yeah that would um that would be to to provide a platform um, for those vo voices to be heard. Jana mentioned that she worked in the youth parliament. We have that sort of thing as well. We have uh, uh, joint sessions of the city council with the representatives from the different youth um, parliaments that are focused in different districts here in the in the city, um, and they bring actually actual proposals into the city council and can have the right to speak there and, and come for present proposals and things like that. I think direct democracy is a very important issue here. Um, we work a lot with uh, um, funding projects. So in different districts, every district gets an online um, uh, fund and they will vote themselves whether they rather want, you know, a new playground there or more benches in the park, whatever. I mean, just, just an example that that is important because that gives people also a sense of participation, of belonging, that they have an impact. I mean, you have to train that a lot. That has to, um, the, there must be structures for that. If, it, if it's a one-off, it won't work. There have to be structures like like the youth parliaments where you you allow people, young people to grow into democratic participation and, and there must, be a visible road that what you're saying there is some recipient and there is a structure for um if if the youth parliament comes with with a proposal there is a duty to react i mean we don't always agree and we don't always have the funding for for each single project that they propose i mean that that's clear but there is a structure in place and they can at least rely on when they come with a proposal we have to take it we ha we have to respond to it we have to analyze it we have to calculate what it costs all all that is in place and that, that i think um as i said there must be a clear visible road that what people what young people particularly have to say just doesn't, doesn't just um dissolve into thin air it's important can i ask a question I would like to know if you um, give them uh, somehow like a framework 
what kind of projects they can propose or is it totally open? Or do you say, uh, well, they have to be related somehow to the issue of climate change or to renewable energies or to something? Is there something like a framework or is it totally open? Uh, not really framework, but uh, what they do get is they um, the people in 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 the administration that work closely with them. They don't they don't just show up for the 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 council meeting, and this is like a big council meeting, like I think once a year, um, and they usually work very closely together with the individual councils. So so they would have a group working with a school council. Um, focus on, on school projects. They would ha have a contact person within the environmental um, department and and they would be able to get advice and communication and uh, uh, input. So what we get out of this uh, are usually proposals that are not um, that are very well connected to the city administration. It's not just you know something that is completely sounds beautiful but has has no way of, of being realized so they get a lot of um, um, support and input and communication before they're presented um, there's not really a framework of what kind of project but it so happens that the majority is environment related usually yeah. that's bringing back a lot of memories to me <laughs> i think um, because i think um, my take i think what before I started getting active, I think always what, what I get to hear was, okay, youth involvement, do you want a new playground? And I think this was pretty much everything, like my city uh, before thought of when they were saying youth participation. I think this this is the important thing, like young people don't only want to decide if there's a skate park or not, young people like have a broader political sense and have a broader political meaning. and. Um, it's very cool to have these opportunities in local communities, um, but when we're talking on a larger level, I usually don't see a lot of mutual respect, let's say, that brought, brought towards the young people. Um, I don't know. I think for me personally, I think it's a very difficult thing because... Um, yeah, just all the prejudices young people are, are encounter, have to encounter when they, they try to talk to the adult politics. Um, I think it's, it's a very difficult thing. And I, I think I've seen a huge transformation in these last three years. And I think it's, it's gotten a lot better. And I think, um, yeah, I think we're finally at a point where we can come with a, with a proposal and young people can come with a proposal and it's taken seriously and people will actually read it before just saying it, it's not possible. Um, but I think, yes, I think it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. And I think this is um, a lot of the frustration from, from, yeah, that activists are facing that like when we founded Fridays for Future, we never expected that we'd have to do this for so long. Um, and I, th because, um, you, you were, we were talking earlier about this issue fatigue and to me this is something so sad that we have to talk about that because to me it's just a point of a, a large part of the population is agreeing that climate change is a very severe issue and that we need to we need to act on it but politics doesn't act on it on a large sufficiently enough level maybe on a local level in some cities maybe but in the whole picture it's not at all enough measures taken. And I would have loved if Fridays for Future after one year, it would just not be necessary because for us, it's so crystal clear that this crisis is so severe and we need to act accordingly that we were thinking just if we remind the politicians, they will realize as well and there will come change. Maybe we were a bit naive in that point. Um, yeah, so I think this, uh, it's a very interesting story to like how young people and politics um, interact. Yeah. But can I add something that, that I've been thinking a lot about? Um, you, you said um, influencing politicians, or what do you call it? You're uh, um, connecting to politicians. There is actually a tool that that is designed for influence, and it's called voting. Um, and <laughs> I, I know it goes both ways. I know, um, um, and I'm, I'm talking to the activist, I know people are disappointed in politicians. I mean, I get that every day. It's not, um, and that is actually actually the, the, the tricky 
tricky thing of going from activism into practical politics that you 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 you're confronted with that um the disappointment um particularly of young people with with politics and politicians but very often when you ask back the answer is i don't vote well there's voting rights and below 18 years you just can't vote in germany so it's a bit <laughs> difficult to just go and vote <laughs> Do you think it's, um, I mean, we're discussing that at, at the moment, whether we should lower the um, voting age to 16. Do you think that would make a huge change? Uh, I'm very much following the voting age because I think it's not, um, a young person is seen capable to do so many things, to sign treaties, to they are, they can go to jail if they do forbidden things. There's so many things that you're legally allowed to under the age of 18. But by law, you're not seen responsible enough to vote. You can even enter, you can even be in a party and actively work in, in a party. You're seen responsible enough for that, but you're not seen responsible enough to go and vote for a party. To me, this is just something... I can't understand and which makes me, yeah, it makes me question why my friends who are below, uh, who are younger than 18 are not allowed to vote. I think this is very, to me, it's just absurd. I, I just can't get why that is. And um, I think this is oftentimes why politics doesn't take young voices so serious because that's not their voting group. Um, and of course, when we're talking demographics, um, it will probably not make the major change in, in the uh, in the end, in the results. But I think at least for the symbolics and also for like an understanding of, of democracy, it's super important to lower the voting age. But also then maybe we're getting a bit carried away from the topic of like climate politics, but <laughs> still very important. <laughs> Not really. I think we, we're quite at the core still. Yeah, I also agree because uh, um, we think about sustainability. We have this, uh, these different dimensions. We, we talk about environment, we talk about economy, we talk about social aspects, and we always have to talk also about democracy, so the participation. So participation is a very important aspect of also the sustainability uh, perspective on, on climate change. Therefore, I think it should be a part. Besides, I totally agree with Sabine, it won't make a big change because unfortunately what, what, uh, what research says is that the younger people don't, don't participate so much in the, uh, uh, the polls. That's unfortunately like this and uh, perhaps with, uh, with Friday for Future this, uh, this might change. So uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a big, a, a big task yeah to also for for the movement to encourage and i, I understand this i i understand if i look uh, as i already said I'm, I'm the local parliament now and it's really it's hard it's really really hard it might be different in Reykjavik, but in, in, in here in germany it's 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 difficult it's difficult and you're really suffering it's nothing for that you say okay today is a meeting of the parliament let's have fun it's it's the other way around and therefore i understand that you get sometimes really frustrated and bored and disappointed and so on but it's I think it's necessary. I totally agree with Sabine. There will be no other way. Uh, you can have movements and movements if you, if you don't touch the power, if you don't try to to get the power. At the long run, you will be you will be um, um, disappointed. You will lose. And concerning, for example, you mentioned also the industry later on that the industry is interested in something. I don't think that the industry is interested in something. I think. Who politicians, politics have to tell them what they should be interested in. Yeah. So if you make the laws like, well, you won't, you have to pay a replacement, or you have to build uh, to pay uh, uh, to repair a certain product for twenty years. They will change their products. They will change their products. You don't have to do anything else. You have to just to say, okay. You have to guarantee that a product works for 20 years. Whatever, I, I'm just inventing 20 years, perhaps it, <laughs> it depends on the product, but you have to go in this direction. And then industry will change 
it's behavior. They are not interested in selling a lot as the, the industry works or as economy works at the moment. Yes, that's logical. In this, in this framework, they are interested in selling as much as possible because that's the way. If you change the framework, I think you can make them work environmentally friendly. You can really make a lot and therefore you need political decisions. You need, you need the power at the end. Yeah. Mm. That was exactly like the point I was trying to make. That's like not the change not going to come from industry itself in its current state, but that we need a political framework um, to change. I just wanted to have like one last remark on that youth participation topic, um, because I think it's in too easy way out to say we're not giving young people democratic rights because they're not going to vote anyway. Maybe the topic is more, the question is more how to make politics more attractive for young people and how to make young voices heard in democ dem democracy and in parliamentary politics. Um, because I think this is the the more important issue to not like blame the young people to, for not going to vote, but um, maybe like have a look at the, how politics is interacting with young people and how they're listening to young people's voices. And I think that makes it very clear where young people don't see a lot of sense in voting, honestly. Um, but still, go vote. It's important, if you can. <laughs> um, now, talking about responsibility in youth, um, we wanted to go back to the third topic, that is perspectives on the climate change action on the global level. And to go back to the global level, this is a question that um, they make specifically to Jana, because they want to know What do you think about um, the young people from Asia or what do you expect uh, from them as an action? I think um, Asia is on a global scale, like a very interesting region because it's um, very much in, in between, between less economically developed countries and industrialized countries. Um, and I have to say, like, I I mean, what are my expectations? I think, like, my expectations toward youth is no other than it is towards the adults, like, to act according to the climate crisis and to to take responsibility and uh, get active and, um, yeah, all that. But I think um, I, I always see my personal activism as a privilege that I am able to be an activist and that I am able and I have the time and the capacities and just the mind space to to think about these things so i i would never say like i expect anything from from anyone i think <laughs> okay that's interesting too um we have here a personal question to sabine i'm searching for it because i i saw it and um on the on the topic of uh, future action and perspectives for climate change action. Um, the the um, public wants to know what brought you from activism to politics, and then maybe you can see, you can tell us a little bit about um, what do you think about um, climate change action on a personal point of view as a person, and also as a person that politics person. <laughs> First, about how I ended up in in that that uh, position of 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 being. Uh, um, well, I prefer to say I'm in politics rather than I'm a politician. Um, uh, yeah, politics. <laughs> uh, I got involved with uh, immigrant issues here, migrant women. We founded an, an an association for migrant women in Iceland, which was a group back then in 2003, which basically had no voice in the public space. And um, the beauty, of course, of a small society, once you let yourself, your voice be heard, it's, it's a, easier to get through. And uh, we were also that lucky that in those years, there was a lot of economic development. So there was a huge influx of foreign workforce at the time. And the administrations and the ministries, and all they, they were like, oh, my God, all these foreigners, what do we do there? We need people who tell us what to do with them. So um, we as activists, and we were a group of, we started off like three, four, five foreign women. Um, but all of a sudden we were very, very attractive because our voice was needed. And uh, so all the doors opened up and um, I 
ended up um, finally in 2014 with my first political campaign simply because I was I was asked to. I was um, I got a call someone saying, "Okay, Sabina, you've been campaigning for immigrants." to have a voice, why don't you join us? And at first it was definitely not in my my um, um, comfort zone. So I said no at, at first. Um, but then they said, okay, how, how, how can you fight for having a voice and then turning it down? And I was offered a good, good position, not just one for you know decoration. I was offered um, basically a position that would give me um, being a, a, a deputy. Uh, city council in, in in 2014 and um and having been an activist for 10 years i thought it was simply my duty i thought i, I yeah just couldn't say no um I, I as i said at first i tried to but it didn't work out um yeah um could you repeat the the last question about what climate change yeah. me personally um, yeah, what would be your recommendation uh, for climate change action, personally and on an industrial level? Mm -hmm. um, what I pointed out uh, maybe earlier, to, to find solutions that are sustainable in the long run. Um, on a personal level, yes, if you have communication, you can do so much uh, repurposing, reusing things and, and, and learning. But in the long run, it has to work out for the whole um, society. So if climate action means someone is losing out on a personal level, um, then, then you, you need to reach that person and you need to, to make some changes to make, make, make things really happen. So I think um, the holistic approaches are needed as a but in, in, on a small scale as i said that 15 minute um uh, district thing um that is a win-win for everyone you don't need a car anymore or, or not many cars for the set for one family um it's better for your health you're walking you're taking the bike um you communicating more more people i mean finding more concepts that make it work for everyone and and we, you um Professor Walling mentioned that the products that are uh, um created um that is also true i mean if if we always look into um if if we buy new things that do not last for more than 3 4 years of course that that doesn't work so so the as i said that uh, we need the more holistic approach and communication between the different groups um, now, um, Jana, what would be here your recommendations for for public personally, and also your recommendations for climate change action to the industry? I think it's from a starting point, like take things seriously and just like inform yourself and inform others if you're in the place to, and then act accordingly. Um, when we are talking about like CO2 budgets or when we're talking about how much emissions are left so we can uh, stay under a certain under a certain temperature mark, then this is, I think it, it from, from this point on, you can break down very easy or not easily, but you can break down um, what actions have to be done in the future. And if you are in a place of power, I think it's very important to be to be aware of that and to be aware of your personal position and what you can do in this position and act responsible for the position you got in be it in the industry or in the politics um this is it it's it's your duty you you're there to be a responsible person for for all the other people who voted you there or if you're in the industry um then you you have a responsibility over over your company um just, I think for me, I think it's it's very, for me, the most important thing is inform yourself and inform others so they can inform themselves. And once once you're there, I think maybe it's my childish view on it, but from there on, the rest seems easy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, something to, to, to add, uh, Professor Bolling?
difficult. So well, everything's already said. <laughs> no, just perhaps one idea. One idea. I'm not sure if it really works. Uh, one idea. Um, I think it might be a good idea to think if uh, the changes that you that you want to do or that you think that should be done could be also very good for you. So ask yourself. How would your life look like if you don't have a car? How to organize it? Would it be perhaps interesting to organize it, to do it like this? Um, how would your life look like uh, if you decide not to travel every year with an airplane, just to make vacations nearby? What are the interesting points nearby? Could this be something interesting? And so ask yourself how your life could look like. What would be the good sides of this? Yeah, perhaps less stress. Yeah, and sometimes, yeah, might be. So I think look for the for, for the bright side. Yeah, of of the change. And um, um, yes, I think responsibility is very very important, so that you feel this responsibility, but. On the other side, responsibility is something also that could be very, yeah, on your shoulders. If you have here all these responsibilities for the whole world on your shoulders, it might be too big. Uh, therefore, um, at least I, I, I tried out personally that some changes that I did during my life are really good for me. <laughs> really good for me and uh, make my life better, my life richer. So I would argue okay this is on the personal level but perhaps this could also work uh, on, on the other levels so if, if you really try to uh, as a politician could our work you know, could, could be more, more successful could be more, more have more uh, also more more fun perhaps and doing our our job yeah and would be more satisfying also for industry producing sim that people yeah, that that uh, that uh, can be seen also in 20 years and 30 years. I remember some engineers that uh, look back to their works and uh, then they see, okay, these old engines were built 100 years ago, and they said, okay, we are somehow proud that we were able to to build these kind of things. So perhaps uh, see the positive things also of sustainability. Say, okay, yeah, it's not. Um, if I, I remember also my grandparents, so they always worry about not to, to, to waste things. And I was sometimes in the world when I remember my grandfather having all these old things <laughs> in the house, uh, saying, okay, perhaps in the future we will need that. Um, these are some of the extreme things, but on the other side, now I see these things a little bit different. And I ask my, sometimes I'm really happy in using old things for doing something new. So in my garden, for example, I built a, a path with, uh, with old stones that I recovered from, from other buildings and so on. And uh, I built this path with these old stones. And I'm really, really happy with this, <laughs> this path of old stones. And I think it's much better than uh, any new path uh, with, with new stones. And sometimes I think, okay, this, well, reusing things, using things and saying, okay, I, I don't need this. I don't need something new. I, I can be creative. I can be happy with doing other things. Could be also a way that you should try out. Perhaps not for everybody, this is the right way, but for at least for some, it might be a, a good approach to uh, to go in this direction. To say, okay, it's it's something positive. It's not just a big burn. <laughs> yeah, I could add something to that because I think um, I'm personally I'm not a big fan of like taking it to the personal level because of course it's great if you enjoy reusing old things, but like if all the cell phones you can buy on the market will not last longer than one year. There's not much you can do individually about it. And I think um, being aware of this, that you individually are not able to change the world and you're not able to save the world. And it's, uh, there's no use if you break yourself when you're trying to make everything perfect. So I think it's very important to keep in mind that we need these frameworks and we need these regulations in order 
of course it will be a lot of changes for everyone individually um but you individually you're not it's not your personal duty to to make everything perfect because in this imperfect world in climate crisis terms it's impossible to have that climate perfect life and i think this is um for me personally this makes things a lot of easier um knowing this like um yeah <laughs> so i think yeah and it's once again i think like in my privileged position i consider it my partial duty to to do things i can do and to and not do things i don't have to do but of course uh, then there's a lot of different perspectives to this and yeah <laughs> thank you now um we have reached the last 15 minutes we have of the panel discussion so i don't know if you um one of you three speakers that we are honored to have here in the ISDI have some questions um for one another or if not then i have some questions from the public i think i would like to ask sabine do you think that like from your journey from becoming from being an activist to become to going into politics, do you ever feel like you had to compromise your values or why you started to become politically active in the, pers in the first place? Um, short answer, yes. Yeah, you do. Um, we started, uh, um, I remember times when we had to make budget cuts, that hurts. Um, when you actually have to raise your hand to making cuts um, in an area w which you care very much about, um, or you have to make compromises. Yeah, that that is tough. Yeah, yeah, that's the easy short short answer is that. But um, then you also see little things that you were able to change, and uh, it's it's very often. Um, those little things that that matter to you personally and uh, give you the energy to to get going. Yeah. So it is it is worth it. It's tough, um, and and uh, I I have found myself in situations where when I go back to let's say my activism environment or the people who are still or new in activism where I used to be. And they now see me, of course, as the establishment. And I have to answer for all the things that um, have not been changed, that myself, have, I and, and they are maybe demanding to change. That, it, that yeah, that, that, that can be tough. Um, and, um, but then again, I think it would not be a good thing if, if people who come from activism burn out quickly and I think that there is a danger that, that they do when they move over to realistic um, real time real life um, um, politics and and that is I don't have a quick answer for that um, the, the danger is there but I would still encourage people to to give it a try because as I said you maybe do not achieve everything that you started out and you have to um, sometimes agree on compromises, but uh, there are still things that you can really, really change. Yeah, that answers your question. Thank you. Some um, some other burning questions from from you, one another. <laughs> no. Okay, then um, we're gonna advance to the um, other questions that were, because I was trying to get the flow going. So some questions I didn't read and here goes the first one. What role does, could climate change activism play in developing countries where politics are mainly concerned on other basic aspects than climate change? I think um, what, what we know is that, uh, especially the developing countries, uh, are very affected by the consequences of climate change. Therefore, I am 100% sure uh, that these are really hot topics for most of these countries. And 
they are topics in many countries. But well, um, perhaps not everybody is concerned with that. But you know, for example, I remember in Nicaragua when we talked about well, um, the forests. Um, there we have this, this problem. Okay, that in the region where where I lived, uh, there have been forests uh, in former times, but nowadays there's nothing. So the question of reforestation well, is a big issue there, and so and people are aware of that. Uh, so I think uh, with a, if you connect us with the daily lives and with the experience of the people, yeah, so people see that they have problems with uh, uh, with the crops because well, um, uh, if there is no rain, okay, then they have no uh, no, no no harvest. So uh, these, these kind of uh, connections are clear for the people. And uh, so I see a big chance there uh, for activism and also for change. And well, uh, in the context of uh, global responsibility, well, sometimes funding is needed for doing such kind of projects and uh, well, doing it with a big, big responsibility and really controlling also what is done because well, we know, okay, if there is money somewhere, okay, uh, someone tries to abuse it. Uh, so, um, uh, it's, it's, it's necessary to do things, and, but there are chances that people will be willing to do uh, these, these uh, necessary things. And I think uh, it can be done and should be done. Uh, and well, uh, the support, the political support was because we see it, they are also like, well, um, they are, um, um, the activists are put in danger in some countries. So if you are trying to protect the environment that you're really, yeah, yeah you, Put your person, the person in danger. So you need this, the support. Yeah, at least this moral support and uh, even more the financial supports and also, well, political support uh, for this uh, for these activities. But I see it's it's not it's not an issue of the global north. It's it's at the end it's more an issue of the global south than of the global north. Uh, and uh, well, uh, I see a lot of. Uh, a lot of um, also people there who are aware of that, but it's not a big movement because, as you said, okay, it's it's it, oh, no, as the question said, it's not the top topic in, in the countries. Yeah. Yeah. And um, a personal question for me to Jana, um, because I think this uh, Fridays for Future is really a nice action, and like Sabine said, and as an advice to put a platform so the voices can be heard. That That's uh, a really nice um, technique. Um, do you are making some relations, um, like global relations, like for example, with um, countries in Latin America or uh, have um, inspiring actions or what are the, the, the things that, that you do? Because you're, you're an organization and then on Fridays you um, go demonstrate for the environment but you also have a, a platform uh, so people can follow you and also be inspired from from other countries or do you uh, have started this um relationship between young people in other countries mm -hmm. yeah um we're definitely trying to i i think mm -hmm. we still need to improve on that but we are, we are having this international network and especially like in the context of most of uh, mapa most affected people and areas um there's been in the Last year, I'd say there have been more and more efforts because especially in Germany, uh, Fridays for Future is a very strong movement and there's very many local groups and it's not that strong in some other countries. So we consider it a bit as like our responsibility to make the voices of people in these countries heard who do not have that or who do not have themselves like the, the possibility to reach um, the head of states from the industry nations or something. Um, so we considered like as our possibility to make these voices from these countries heard. Um, and of course, when we're talking, um, yeah, when we're, when we're making for our, everything we have as an output, be it like speeches and demonstrations or social media content, um, we always try to have like a focus on uh, including voices from these MAPA states um, or areas and people. Um, and yeah, but I think we still definitely need to improve on this. And um, I think, but because I think what was founded as like a student's movement where like students were thinking, okay, we want a, a livable future. Um, and now we're starting to see things in a, in a broader context and um, more in the world. And also when we're having these 
global climate strikes, then we're having like, it's like, it's a very difficult procedure to determine the date. Um, <laughs> but like the countries have different, different rates, like how important, like, even if the country is small, they get more voices and like this. Um, so definitely like in the communication, we, we have, we have a lot of communication and we, we try to, um, yeah, make their voices heard. That's nice. Yeah, I just um, it was just out of curiosity if you already have like a global network because I can imagine like um, as a communicator, I don't know the Instagram and you know the Fridays for Future in Germany, Fridays for Future in Guatemala, Fridays for Future in Nicaragua, Iceland, and then like ah, it's a whole front. So it's a beautiful idea. I think now with the platforms that we are giving and the networks and the connection, um, it's easier to imagine it and i know it's a lot of work to 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 put it through so um i wish you the best of luck and and, and thank you thank you very much um for doing what you do um i think it's inspiring thank you for your time that you are the youngest of all of all of us here and um with that we have reached um the time of the panel discussion um i thank you uh, for your time uh, professor Bolling, sabine and, and jana um please give us some um goodbye words maybe i don't know a little a little speech a little quote a little um words of encouragement and thanks again um for doing what you do in the different fields and for your time again here today on this sunday thanks a lot great fun <laughs> thank you for the info for the invitation it was really nice with you to talk yeah um, something you want to 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 add as as goodbye words, um, inspiration. What's on your heart left? <laughs> for me, maybe just my my thanks to to Jana and and Fridays for Future that that has an impact on on people like me. <laughs> so keep going. Yeah, thanks for trying to bring up points in the parliament. I guess um, I I think I'd like to say because. It, sometimes it seems like very big magic what we're doing, but in the end, it's not. It's just we just care about something and then we talk to people about it. And I think that that is what in the end being an activist is to me, like being like being passionate about topics and talking, talking about it to people. And I think um, I encourage, of course, everyone to become an activist and just to start talking and caring about uh, yeah, the things you care about. And I think um, it's a beautiful way to participate in society and shape our society and the future. Thank you so much. Then, um, once again, thank you all of you and for all the public and is viewers that are now watching. Um, tomorrow, we're going to have a keynote about an, at 2.30 p.m of how to prevent the next pandemic. So be there. <laughs> at 6.30, we're gonna have a live sports session. And then uh, at 7 p.m., we're gonna have another panel discussion about sustainable energy. So stay tuned and thank you all of you for your time and your encouragement and all these interesting topics. See you um, the next time. <laughs> thank you. Thanks Bye. for inviting me. Bye, thanks. <laughs>